Now, before I move on to some real subjects, whilst on this skullduggerous subject of TV broadcasting, several times whilst broadcasting the shows on Showcase TV, viewers emailed me claiming they thought Rich Panett was being interfered with during the shows, and the signal deliberately intercepted somehow, particularly on controversial shows. Many times the signal seemed to be interrupted at key moments in particular programmes. One example of this, which occurred recently, was a show featuring Neil Sanders talking about how the CIA used the music industry in the 1960s to spread the use of LSD in order to test the drug out on young people and see if it could be used to control and manipulate them. To back this up, Neil gave a quote from John Lennon, and just at the point where Neil starts to read John Lennon's quote, the audio cut out completely and was immediately switched back on as soon as the quote had ended. Here's the quote that appeared to have been censored. Fool. He was asked by um, Playboy magazine if, if he'd uh, ever he'd still use acid, and he says, not in years, a little mushroom or peyote perhaps, it's not beyond my scope. You know, maybe twice a year or something, but you don't hear about it anymore. Uh, people are still visiting the cosmos, and then this is a telling thing. He says, we must always remember to thank the CIA and the Army for LSD. That's what people forget. Everything is the opposite of what it is, isn't it? So get out the bottle boy and relax. They invented LSD to control people, and what they did was give us freedom. Sometimes it works in mysterious ways. It's wonders to perform. If you look in the government reports on acid, the ones who jumped out the window or killed themselves because of it, I think even with Art Linklater's daughter, it happened to her years later. So let's face it, she wasn't really on acid when she jumped out the window, and I've never met anybody who's had a flashback on acid. I've never had a flashback in my life, and I took millions of trips in the 60s. What, uh, the point that he's making is that he is aware that the military-industrial complex originally introduced LSD mm -hmm. as a way to stymie dissent and to basically get people into a big, heady fog mm -hmm. so that they can't actually achieve mm -hmm. anything of any use. Mm -hmm. All right, Neil. You might ask, why would they want to censor that particular quote from John Lennon? Well, maybe the same reason they murdered him. One reason might be that this practice is still going on, that the music artists of today being listened to by millions are still being used as tools of social control and dumbing down. Now a great deal has happened recently in our news about the fiasco going on in Syria which is just another country on America's hit list with the intention to bring about world domination. America is doing all it can with the help of the CIA, MI6 and other shady groups to engineer excuses to get rid of the current Syrian government. Note, I use the word government, not the disgustingly loaded word used by mainstream media, the Syrian regime. Ooh. Of course, Syria is not the final target on America's hit list. Many more will probably follow, including Iran, which America have suddenly started trying to be all pally with. I'm sure this is just a short-term tactic of deception while they get Syria out of the way, which is proving slightly problematic. Let's just ask the question, who is threatening who here? Here is a map of Iran. Each dot on this map is an American military base. Now let's look at a map of America and plot the Iranian military bases around the United States. Hmm, there don't seem to be any. Who is the true aggressor here? It's not a difficult one, is it? A few months back, I briefly reported on a recent animal mutilation case on Dartmoor in Devon. It was reported in Mail Online and the headline read, Satanic cult blamed for ritualistic killing of Dartmoor Fall, which was horrifically mutilated in the centre of a ring of fire during full moon. Here's animal mutilation expert David Caton. The pony case of Dartmoor, which was just in July this year, mm. uh, the press were reporting from some unknown witnesses there was a ring of bird marks around the horse, implying some satanic cult had taken place and they lit fires or candles or a mixture of both as part of the, the ceremony around the poor animal. But that's not the case because they weren't fire burn marks because um, Jenny Thornton of the Southwest Equine Protection Group who went to the scene and took some excellent pictures of the two month old foal, a male foal, uh, and she said these brown patches around the animal and they weren't in a neat circle they were sort of circular, you might say, but again they were stained brown, as though, which is where animals sometimes urinate at the same spot, like we found on the lawn with the dog. You know, if it always wheezed 
burns the grass. Right. It were, wasn't fire burns. Right. Uh, so. Okay. So something else. Something other than else. Yeah. Other than a satanic cult fire. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Right. It was just the, the media making yeah. the excuse for the death of the pony. You know. Right. Okay. Which the police went with for a while, and then they finally issued a report in the last ten days to say. The, after the result of their investigations, ha ha ha, it's animal predation. End right. of story. So <laughs> Close the case, right. <laughs> which is quite ridiculous. Yeah, and very uh, an very annoying to the people in the Southwest Equine Protection Group and other people who who know it can't be right. Know what predators, what predators can do, yeah. and what they don't do. You know. I wonder if Mail Online are going to correct their totally misleading story. Of course not, because it is misleading for a reason. And that reason is, mainstream media are not allowed to report animal mutilation cases truthfully, because they have to comply with the cover-up on this issue. Now, I've been investigating cases related to animal mutilation and will be launching a new film later in the year, so keep your eyes out, not literally, for that details to be announced shortly. Now, if you've watched the latest Rich Planet film, Almost Identified Flying Objects, which is available to watch from the website via this link, free of charge, you will know that I suspect it is likely there are secret underground facilities in the UK being used to house undisclosed silent flying triangular vehicles. Here's a clip. All the activity on this map took place recently, between 2010 and 2012. The red arrows indicate where black triangles have been seen moving and the arrow indicates the direction. The red triangles show where triangular craft have been seen hovering. A total of nine separate black triangles have been spotted around Todmorden over the last two years and that's just cases that have been reported. There could be hundreds more unreported. Could the triangles be returning to this area and be using it as a base to access some of the other areas where triangles are commonly seen, such as Stafford, Lincolnshire, Derbyshire, East Yorkshire and further afield? Another important thing to note here, there is not a single piece of witness testimony of a silent black triangle landing at a UK military base. If they are returning to a base, they are not returning to known military bases. If I was asked to speculate, I would guess there might be a facility under the land or inside a hill somewhere in the Todmorden area, which is possibly accessed via a water feature such as a lake or reservoir. But what I can say with absolute certainty is some group or groups are flying craft which are way beyond the capabilities of any publicly known aircraft. They are doing it right under our noses and they are doing it without public permission. Are you happy about this? As I've said throughout the film, we need to find out where these things are going, then expose it to the world. If there are undisclosed secret bases being used to house these craft, I have some good ideas as to how they might be discovered. Anyone else who has further ideas, please get in touch via the website. In order to try and locate some of these potential bases, I have started a surveillance project involving surveilling certain parts of the UK with hidden cameras which have high UFO activity. I suspect it may take years to get some good evidence. The stealthy nature of some of these craft described by witnesses in the film suggests they may be hard to detect. So far in my research I have not found any evidence of bases in the areas that I've been surveilling so far. I would like to appeal to members of the public on two counts. Firstly, I'm interested in people suggesting locations that may be active so I can fit my own surveillance equipment. Secondly, if any viewers want to purchase their own surveillance equipment, perhaps the video I'm about to show you will inspire you to get out there and monitor some regions of the UK yourself. After all, the more evidence gatherers we have out there, the more likely we will find evidence of undisclosed bases. So just coming out of Hebden Bridge now, on the road to Todmorden, and these, these towns run along the bottom of the valley. Very steep hills either side. And these are the hills that people have seen black, silent, triangular craft either hovering stationary or travelling slowly across, generally across from one side of the valley to the other.
just arrived here in Todmorden and the reason why I'm here is um, I'm going to be placing some hidden cameras in the area just north of Todmorden with the hope of catching some UFO activity. If you look at these cases across Britain uh, you find that there's a concentration in the West Yorkshire Lancashire border region which is where Todmorden is it's right on the border if you look at Auden survey maps and just look at this particular region um, that area north of Todmorden is very interesting because it's a huge expanse of land where a it's extremely mountainous and B there are no roads for many many miles so it would be an ideal place um, to hide or land these particular craft because I'm of the mind that the most likely place that they're going to is the land. I don't think that they're flying back off into space. They're always seen flying low. They're always seen flying slowly. Um, and I haven't got many accounts of people saying, well, it flew off in, into high altitude or anything like that. Generally, they're just seen hovering low, traversing the landscapes. People go to UK military bases and they stand there and they watch the aircraft and they log the aircraft coming in and out of them. And I haven't got a single witness testimony of somebody seeing a silent black triangle landing or taking off from a UK military base. So if there is a base, it's an undisclosed base, and if it's going to be an undisclosed base, it's going to be somewhere remote. Now there are other areas other than the area just north of Todmorden, which are other candidates for this. Uh, there's an area north of Skipton, which is there's an has been alleged activity there in the past, and there's another area just northwest of Clitheroe another very large area of unpopulated land but I've chosen this area because it's a bit like um, if let's say you want to try and find where a beehive is you just follow the concentration of bees and as you get closer and closer to the beehive the bees get more and more concentrated so you can then locate the hive and that's that's the kind of mindset that I'm using here now if we look at this map that I've got here um, I think the most likely places in the vast unpopulated space in the center of this map. Now what I intend to do is to travel around the circumference of that area um, on, the, on the roads which give a view of the area and what I'm going to do on the Auden survey map I'm going to shade in all of the areas that can be observed from the road because if you're going to build a secret covert area for these craft it's not going to be within visual sight of a road it's going to be behind uh, the local hills there now there are a number of reservoirs in this area okay just the dark areas there and I think there's a chance that a reservoir um, is possibly used now that's just a hunch don't know that so but the first part of the exercise is to circumnavigate uh, this entire area um, on these very narrow roads just shading in on the map the areas that we can see now then once I've got this map um, that will hopefully reveal locations that are more likely to be used as some secret facility and once I've identified those positions um, I'm then going to use one of these these are hunting cameras all right so people use them they'll put them out the the batteries will last for up to three weeks and they've got this one's got three PIR detectors so there's a very wide um, field of view that it detects motion in when it detects motion it will take a sequence of photographs and they work at night because there's an infrared illuminator here and it'll take infrared pictures uh, when the when the light is low this device contains a memory card so I've got a um, 16 gigabyte memory card in there. The camera comes with a, a mounting bracket so you attach this bracket using this cord to a fence post or a tree and you've actually got reserve batteries in this in the mounting bracket just there so you've got four batteries in here and you also have four batteries in the camera so you've got eight batteries in there. Um, you then as I say you strap the bracket to the tree and then you fit the camera onto the bracket and then at say two week intervals you come you check the camera it's got a little screen on the back here you can actually review 
I've got a, a, a password there. You can actually review the photographs that have been taken on site using this L, uh, LCD screen. And what I intend to do is just to leave them running and every, every few weeks um, get someone to come along, change the memory card, um, and change the batteries. I'm not necessarily expecting these cameras to take photographs of triangular craft. But what I what I am suspecting, and I have got I've bought three of them, I've got three of these hunting cameras, is to place them in that particular region. And let's just say one of them um, keeps disappearing, or one of them keeps being interfered with, or what have you. Then that's perhaps a clue that we're getting close. Uh, and I do intend to put them in places where no one's going to see them. All right. Um, now you might say, well, if they're if they're flying advanced craft, they're going to see an infrared light. Uh, they're going to have, they're going to be able to detect infrared. Well, perhaps, but as I say, I'm not necessarily doing this to capture images of the craft. I'm doing it to see whether any of these cameras actually get tampered with or disappear, because that then could lead us to a location. I think the vast majority of cases, these craft are seen at night. This is Hepton Stall. Let me pull over here. And I'm going to sh start shading in the map. Quite high up now, and this really this is the start of the road which goes around the area that we're interested in. We'll shade this in, so we can't really see over the top of this hill. I'm overlooking um, Red Spa Moor. The road I'm on now is a very narrow track, and it cuts back through to Hebden Bridge across the middle of this um, unpopulated area um, and this this is quite a hairy road now there's a, there is another area to the north of this road but I'm, I'm going to go back along the Hebden Bridge and just keep shading in parts of the map so we've got a gorge to the left or a valley to the left there which we can see so I'm going to mark that off on the map but we've got no visibility over this hill so we're now getting to the more remote parts of this area Welcome to Calderdale. This is uh, Widop Reservoir, W-I-D-D-O-P. It's one of the larger ones. But I don't think they'd be building a base uh, near a reservoir like this that's got a road running right the way alongside it. So we'll continue on. I've dri driven along this road past uh, Widop Reservoir, which I filmed. Uh, then I went past um, there's actually a pub here, but it, it doesn't look like it's frequented very much. It's quite remote, called the Pack Horse. Come round a few um, airplane bends here, and I'm I'm just I'm just here. Okay. Now there's a, a road here which actually goes uh, to Gorp, Gorpel Lower Reservoir, and there's another one called Gorpel Upper Reservoir. Now it's interesting that. I was not able to see either of these reservoirs from this road or from any of the roads here or from the roads down here. So these these two reservoirs are not visible via any road, which is interesting. And I guess uh, this this one isn't either. You can't see you can't see this reservoir by driving along that road because there's a hill here. Um, now I'm just at the entrance, well I'm not the, the entrance, I'm the entrance to this road which is there. You see that there, which that road takes you to Gorbel Reservoir. Now it's saying here, no access to Gorbel Upper Spillway site via this entrance. Oh, and I'm at the gate entrance which leads to Gorbel Reservoir. The other entrance you're not allowed to use. We can walk to the reservoir, but it looks it's well and truly padlock we've got. You can't get your vehicle along here unless you've got access to, to open that padlock. Very interesting that it's that there's another sign just a little bit further up the road saying no off-road vehicles, no motorcycles on this land because it's of scientific interest. But that's all you can see from the main road, just this end of the dam. And you can't see the other one at all, the other reservoir which is further up. I'm going to drive um, along this road and see if it actually comes out with the reservoir or not and it's this road ahead of us here. This land 
is part of the South Pennines Moor site of special scientific interest. Okay. So that's the second time I've seen one of them, and it's it seems to be specific um, to this area. Uh, Gorpel Reservoir, three quarters of a mile. Okay. So you can walk to the reservoir along this path, um, but it's three quarters of a mile from this gate. This is the only other access point to the to these two reservoirs. I might as well walk the remaining. Um, Three quarters of a mile as it says. This is pretty remote up here. They're right on the path. Now it's probably just a herd of cows, but I'm not going to risk it. There might be a bull among them. Shit. Right on the brow of that hill, I reckon you'll be able to see the reservoirs. Right, I'm now at a place called Hurstwood Reservoir. Now this reservoir is not easy to see from the, any road either. Um, it is quite near the village of Hurstwood where you've got the houses. Let's have a look here. Um, Cant Clough Reservoir, you can see from the road. I've shaded it there, you can see. So, this section of the reservoir, you can see it from the road over here. Um, Hurstwood Reservoir, which is the next one up, there's very little visibility from main roads. Um, you can't see it on this approach road. Uh, I am somewhere down here in the car park. So this is Hurstwood Reservoir. You take a look at it. It's not overlooked by any roads or houses. It's very well contained. Interesting, interesting feature. It don't look natural to me. What are they? Some more up there. Right the way along the top of that hill. These mounds don't look... Are they natural? So this is very well hidden as well, this particular waterway here. I haven't actually seen this at all yet. Um, you can't see it from that road at all. And I would imagine you're not going to be able to see it um, from these roads up here. But I do need to have a drive up, up these roads just to check. But this, you've got this, this is the huge area of land here. So we've got one, two, three, four, well this is split into two, three, four. All of these reservoirs you can't see from any road and you can't drive along them at all. Um, and to the north of them is this huge area of land. So. Um, and there's a, if you were to drive along this reservoir, you can see that reservoir from the road, but there's a very steep cliff running right along the side of here, which is ob all of this area here is completely obscured from view. You've got no visibility of, of, of this area here from anywhere. And in this zone here, there are no walkways. The, the nearest walkway is this one going along here, now, which, is, which is Pendle Way. It would be interesting to walk along here just to see what visibility of this area you have but to me the areas which are possible candidates would be uh, this reservoir uh, these two and this this area here but it's a huge area a mile is about a mile is about that so you know you've got an area one two three four maybe five miles across I'm going to go to a place called Cornholm where there's been at least four sightings um, over the last couple of years just traversing over the top of the valley. The Cornholm is before you get to top of it along this road so I want to try and find somewhere with a good vantage point overlooking Cornholm across the valley to put the camera in. Just look at that landscape. Okay, I'm just having a look at the map, and um, I've got Tubbard in here, and I've drawn on the map some recent sightings, and th uh, this also shows the direction of what, of what people have seen UFOs move in this direction, this direction, also this direction, there's another one here, that direction. So, I've actually just driven past um, Stones Lane, this is Stones Lane, I drove along this road from Tubbard, so I'm actually parked up about here, 
okay so I think it would be a very good place to put a camera here looking out over the valley because the valley straight ahead of me there that I'm just pointing out on the map that's over the top over the brow of that hill is where I've positioned the other cameras um, just beyond these reservoirs here on one of those fence posts there looking out over this valley would be a great place to put one of the cameras so I'm gonna just see if I can do that let's get out of the car okay now this one's in a much more conspicuous place than the others As you can see they might see it but that's a risk I guess it's in a really good position this is Todmorden down there looking straight across the valley and there's been multiple sightings over the last couple of years of lights traversing this this part of the valley. Got here a bit later than I thought but still thought I'd risk it. Maybe we might see something with it being dusk. Anyway I've got about two miles to walk before I pick up the, the two remote cameras and then I'm going to go and get the other one. The camera that I, I left there two and a half weeks ago and it should be uh, somewhere on the top of that wall, but I hope it's going to be there. Yes, it's still there. I can see. You little beauty. Off the beaten track. In the middle of nowhere. Right. Whether the batteries are. Well, uh, whether the batteries are still going. Right, I've got it, but I'm going to get straight back onto them. One of the main paths, because otherwise I'm going to set me neck. One down, two to go. Um, I've got about another mile to this reservoir and it's getting very dark now so I'm going to I'm going to run right I've just run about a mile to this reservoir I have to be really careful here cold water kills bathing prohibited whoops you right it's um after 10 p.m. now, as I said, it's the 1st of August, 50 yards along this shore. Okay, let's walk along. You little beauty. Still there. Yes, we have two cameras. Okay, now I've just got to negotiate the way back. Right, I'm walking back now. Pretty much getting pitch black now, so I'm going to start. Uh, running along this track the last probably about a mile. Looks like that film. What is it? American Werewolf in London. <laughs> God. At least it's not a full moon. So there are aircraft kind of fly over this region on the Manchester Airport route. <coughs> right, there's something coming overhead there now. Uh, yeah, you can hear the engine noise. So yeah, it's a plane going to Manchester Airport probably. Pretty much above the top of it. I think there's another one over there. Right, I'm back in the car now, or the van as I now have. There is another camera to get, but that one's by main road, so I can drive to that one. What time is it now? It's 20 to 11. Right, I'm at the spot with the third camera, and this is the one that I most likely think is might not be there because it, it wasn't in a particularly hidden location but I think I could see the strap let's go have a look yeah there's the strap oh it's still there you beauty overlooking the whole valley you probably can't see that with this with this light okay so I've got all three cameras back nice and safe and I'm gonna have some fun looking at those SD cards Now one interesting facility between Todmorden and Bakeup is an amateur observatory on the side of a hill. Last year in October 2012 I went to investigate the site and although the observatory was closed I was invited in for a look around by the astronomer. What I found very bizarre was the main observing dome which is 25 feet in diameter did not have its telescope in commission. It was lying in the corner of the dome out of the way seemingly totally out of use. 
Instead, the dome was operating a magnifying mirror, which was able to observe all of the local surrounding countryside, which was being reflected onto a six-foot diameter screen, forming a large round table in the centre of the dome. The moving live images being reflected onto the table were also being video recorded. I wondered just exactly what it was they were looking for. Certainly not stars and planets with this configuration. If you were to draw a line from Hebden Bridge through Todmorden to Bacup and then a little bit further to where we've been to the those three reservoirs at Haslingdon, that's where many of the recent sightings have been of these black triangles, silent, and this area of the Pennines was known as UFO Alley. We're just climbing out of Bacup and towards Tubmerdon. If there's triangular craft darting about these hills, they would not be seen by the radar at Manchester Airport because of the terrain. So is that why they choose these kind of places? just noted we're on the road um, from Bake up to Topperton and there's a couple of telescopes or what look like um, the domes of telescopes on the side of these hills very interesting there we go what's that looking out for right, yeah, I didn't know they were there there we go Topperton's here and we were driving along this road here and something I was not aware of was the uh, telescopes that I saw um, and we've just found it on the um, Orden survey map where is it? the astronomy center this little map here of Hebden Bridge uh, Tubmerdon and Bacup is a map that I drew of some of the UFO activity of flying triangles you can see the arrows here represent the, um, where triangles have been spotted. Now look at this line here. I did not know that there was an astronomy center anywhere in this region. We've just driven past these telescopes and I've, I've drawn it, a letter A on the map there. That's where the astronomy center is and it goes right through or the, the path of this UFO that I've drawn which was witnessed in January 2012 flying over Bacup uh, towards Bacup from Tobberden was right through that point. We've got flying triangles at um, Waterfoot in April 2010 and we've got an astronomy center right in the middle of our UFO activity. We're heading, we've turned round, we're now heading back uh, towards this astronomy center. There we go. Right, I've just walked up this steep embankment to have a look at the astronomy center and there's there's just there's a sign here, a website address, telephone number. So wh where I was filming before was where that uh, yellow sign is, and I was just stood at the top of that embankment. So we've got quite a large uh, dish there, or sorry, quite a large dome there. And if I pan right round, there's another dome perched right on the brow of that smaller hill. Yeah. If we have uh, just small groups, which tends to be on Saturday nights, so they come yeah. in dribs and drabs. Okay. We've we, we got another... Do you want yeah. sound for this? No, no, it's alright, you just keep talking, yeah. So we're inside the dome here, of the, of the, is this the largest uh, dish? The largest uh, dome in, on the site? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. how big is this one? About, what, 30 feet or it's, something? It's uh, 20, 29 feet. 29 feet, yeah. okay. Fascinating. Mm. And we, that's the sort of slot there where it looks, looks out and the whole dome rotates. Fantastic. We, we've got the same telescope as this in a smaller observatory. Right. So when we've got small groups, you know, we can just whiz, whiz it around anything you want to see. It's also computer controlled, so you can key in anything you want to see, it will automatically go to it, which saves a lot of right. messing it, about. And that's a reflector? Yeah, yeah, what? the Schmidt, Schmidt Cassegrains. Yeah. And what size reflector is it? 16 inch. 16 inch reflector. Yeah. Is that the biggest telescope that you've got here then? Is no, it? that's the biggest one. All right. That's a, that's a 30 inch. All right, so the mirror's not mounted on it though, is it not? No. So where's the mirror? 
It's, sorry? Where's the mirror? The, the, well, the, the mirror will be in the bottom, in that, in that sort of box, all right, box so you, part there, but it's out of it at the moment. But all right. it's, it's somewhat mothballed because right. you, you have to push it around, you know, yeah. and the motor drives on it. So and it's a 30-inch reflector, yeah? Yeah, 30-inch reflector, yeah. Very good, very good. But you're just using the 16-inch reflector at the moment, yeah? Using the 16-inch, yeah. Right. I mean, okay. it's plenty big enough for what we need to show the general public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up, okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So this is known as a what? A, something obscura? Camera obscura. This Camera is, yeah. obscura. So this is a, a, it's basically a plate which is about five feet in diameter. Yeah, and you've got a mirror up there. Yeah, this, this, is, this is just over six foot. Uh, right, six just foot over six foot. Yeah. And it's showing it's you... Got a, it's got an angle of about um, 22 degrees. Right. So it's like looking for a pair of monopolies with twice, twice the field of view. Right. It's just getting a bit brighter now. Is it? If the sun, if the sun came out, that would, you know, all, all the colours would really stand out. So normally, astronomy, you're focused right in on something really small, like Mars or something. But this has got an extremely wide field of view. It is, yes. Yeah, so, right. so why would you need really wide field of view in an observatory if you're That's looking right, at stars? Yeah. Yeah. So why would you need that? Such the, a wide field. The advantage field. is that the view you get on the table is the view you'd get if you were standing on top of the dome. Okay. So you I get see. quite an advantage from that. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, they're only as good as what you can see, obviously. But I, I, I used to make these commercially, mm -hmm. and I've got them all over the, all over the world. Uh, right. If you've got somewhere where there's a wonderful view, you know, you can bring it in. Right. I've made them for, for, uh, for private people who used to have a wonderful view, and then they built all round. But if you put one of these on the roof, you know, it brings in the view they used to enjoy. And yeah. better, because you're higher up to see it. Right. <laughs> Is this an aluminium, aluminium uh, disc, thin disc with painted white? You've got to have something for the image to, to fall on, so you see, but the reflectivity of this is only a few percent compared to mm -hmm. the mirror. But you can't form an image on a mirror if yeah. you put one away from it. So, so, so can you, you have to have something that, that will, it will show up on. So can you record this image? Sorry? Can you record it? You can, yeah. Right, okay. So when there's people not here, do they record it and look at it, or...? People, people photograph it. Right, okay. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, it is a lot brighter than this um, right. when the sun's out. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. You could even see individual sheep on the surrounding hillsides, all very Bob Lazar. This facility reminded me of the observing pool featured in the Fortress of Ultimate Darkness in the film Time Bandits. Stand by for mind control. If you have any thoughts on how I can improve the surveillance project or want to suggest areas you think may be active, please get in touch via the website. That's all for this week and remember, believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night.